Commissioner with the Chaska Human Rights Commission, and we are all so excited to have you here today and online if you're watching the recording. Um, thank you for being here with us. Uh, the Chaska Human Rights Commission has created several events throughout the month of April to celebrate individuals who have immigrated to the United States, Minnesota, and specifically to Chaska. As you can see out in the lobby, we are hosting Green Card Voices. Um, feel free to take a look at the different panels that we have out there. There's uh, QR codes on each panel. You can use your phone to take a photo and learn more about the stories of each of the individuals that are represented out there um, who are immigrants to Minnesota. Um, and this evening, we have a, a panel of um, different uh, immigrants to the United States, Minnesota, and specifically to Chaska, who have agreed to come and share their stories and answer some questions um, and just share a little bit more about their lives. Um, so I'm going to introduce them quickly, and then I will get out of the way because I'm in a big yellow dress and kind of the middle of the stage. Um, <laughs> uh, this is Nayeli Becerra Castillo. She immigrated from Mexico when she was four years old. She spent her most formative years in Chaska, and specifically in the Chaska School District. Um, Nayeli moved south for college, attending Northwestern College in Iowa, very far south, where she majored in public relations and volunteered at local nonprofits that focused on serving the indigenous Guatemalan youth and their families. Uh, after college, Nayeli returned to Chaska Schools um, where she worked as an intercultural specialist for six years. Today, she's the Assistant Director for Student Diversity and Inclusion Services at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, where she's also pursuing a master's degree in leadership in student affairs. And Nayeli is gonna be the moderator for this panel tonight. Uh, Nanama Ajay, is that right? Okay, thank you. <laughs> Was born in Accra, Ghana in West Africa. She's married to Sam, and together they share four children. Nana Ama and her family immigrated to the United States about 15 years ago, living in several different places before eventually settling in Chaska in 2012, which they still call home. Nana Ama worked at home for 13 years, raising her children and homeschooling them. She recently returned to the out-of-home workforce and is employed at the Chaska City Hall. Nana Amo went to the university in went to university in Ghana um, and recently returned to school here in the U.S. where she's studying uh, science with the goal of working in the medical field. Then we have Gabriela Bolanos. Uh, she moved from Mexico to the United States in 2005 and has made Chaska her home since then. She co-owns the amazing restaurant Chaska My Love with her mother which has been, open, <laughs> has been open for 17 years and located in downtown Chaska. If you haven't checked it out yet, please do so immediately. She's uh, happily married to her husband and together they have a uh, 16 month old son, Carlos. Next to her, we have Mary Hernandez, who's going to be interpreting for her tonight. Um, and she's here from the organization Mikasa. And then finally, we have Maria Ochoa Guillen de Schindler. She was born and raised in Ecuador. She has a degree in social communications with an emphasis in journalism and a certificate in English. She worked as a radio producer and teacher and then decided to travel the world. In 1999, she moved to Egypt. And it was during her years in the Middle East that she met her husband, Ken, a native of Chaska. To this day, when their first son wants to impress someone, he calls Maria and puts her on speaker and says, Mom, tell them, and Maria knows, to confirm that yes, in fact, he was born by the pyramids in Egypt, and yes, he's also fluent in Spanish. <laughs> Maria moved with her family back to Minnesota in 2003, where she got a master's in education from the University of Minnesota. Today, Maria is a Spanish teacher at Chaska High School and a Zumba and yoga instructor at the Chaska Community Center. She's, she's a member of Q, Humans United in Equity, and is the advisor of SOAR, Student Organization Against Racism at Chaska High School. So please uh, join me in welcoming everybody on stage here today. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, as part of tonight, I want to start with the land acknowledgement. As part of my immigrant story, um, for the longest time, I felt kind of rejection on both sides from my cultures, like be, not being American enough and not being Mexican enough. 
Um, and I never felt like I had my place or felt like I belonged until I met an elder here in Chaska named Wally, who um, belongs to one of our indigenous communities. Um, and it was then that I was telling him my indigenous story that I have in Mexico that we speak Nahuatl, um, not just Spanish. Um, and it was in that moment that he called me, yes, you're my cousin. Um, so when he called me relative, right, cousin, I found my place again in these homelands. Um, so with that being said, um, I just want to recognize that, you know, Minnesota is um, from the Dakota name for this region also known as Minnesota Makoche, um, which means the land where the waters reflect the clouds. So today as we gather in Chaska, Chaske, meaning firstborn son, um, I want to recognize that the Ojibwe, Dakota, Ho-Chunk, and numerous other indigenous communities whose cultural, spiritual, economic practices are intrinsically woven into the landscape and hold this land sacred. So tonight, um, as we are gathered, I see everyone's commitment here present, um, you know, committed to the work of truth telling and really getting to know each other's stories um, and building that relationship with one another. So thank you, it's an honor to be here. Um, with that being said, um, our first, my first question, first question for tonight is tell me about your immigration story in your own words. Um, so we will start with Nana. So again, my name is Nana Amamaje. Um, I moved here about 15 years ago, and my husband had been here already before I moved in here. And my first, um, my the first, I, I came straight to New York, and it was around May, and it was okay. So I came to Minnesota and arrived in <laughs> May, and it's, it was really cold. And that year. There was snow in May, so. But as I'm still here, I've been here, <laughs> so I've got anywhere here. But um, I, I moved here to Minnesota because my husband was already here, so I joined him here. And um, it's been, it has been, it has been really a learning experience with weather and the, just the way in the landscape is, everything is so spread out. From that, where I come from, you can literally stand in a house and all that things are next door. And then everything is so close. And then, um, but it's been, it has, it has been, it was a challenge, but right now I can, I can say that, yes, this is my home because I have learned to be a Minnesota too, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, um, my name, my and where I come from, we have different um, different tribes that that each one have a language, their own language, and my name um, is from the tribe called Akan, and um, but I speak the dialect Fanti that is from Akan, and um, for our tribe, every name has a meaning. It can tell you where the, where the person is coming from in the country, which family they are from exactly, um, whether they are female or male, what position they are, the birth position they are in, um, in the family, whether they are the first boy or second boy or third boy in the family. Um, and so my name, I got my Nana part of my first name um, from my, my grandfather who was a chief. I, I would, you shouldn't call me royalty because I don't really, I don't really kind of, I'm not really connected to that. But he was, he was from the royal family. My grandfather was royal family, and I was named after him. So I got his title, Nana. That's what the Nana means. But my other name, Ama, uh, means a female born on Saturday. And I have, I have another middle name that means that I'm the first female in my, in my family. So, um, I, as I said, my husband had already, already been here, so I just moved in and joined him with whatever he was doing. So that was, that's my, my little story, yeah. Thank you. Okay, hi, my name is Gabby. I'm with you in uh, 2005, 
and I'm living here because my mom uh, lived here since 1999, and I miss her a lot. And was easy for me moving here because my mom said one person to bring me, so it was easy. And I was young and it was a grand adventure for me <laughs> moving here. So I feel nice and good here because I know a lot of people and a lot of friendly people. And I know my mom working a lot and I had the opportunity to help, to help some, my mom and my family in Mexico. Hi everyone, thank you for, for coming. Um, love is blind, that's how I ended up here. Uh, I met my husband when I was teaching in Egypt. He was a professor at the American University in Cairo and the back story is long, but I, um, I, I met him, we exchanged email addresses and a few years later, um, I found his, his email address, sent him an email and he said, Let's get together. And I said, where? He goes, McDonald's. And I was like, oh. He's asking me out to McDonald's. His side of the story is, everybody knew where McDonald's was. I didn't want it to get lost. But then I took you to the, to the restaurant across the street. Um, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, so yeah, we got married in Egypt. My son was born there. And uh, when we started raising our family we decided you know we need to go uh, we need to go home whatever that might be um, and my husband said you know if you want to go to Ecuador I'm good I'm good with that we can go there um, but where I am from is wonderful it's a little cold in the winter it's a little hot in the summer <laughs> the springs are so beautiful and so I said sure and that year I got frostbite um, that was my first summer, and then I'm allergic to mosquito bites, so my first summer was kind of interesting. Uh, but I, I, love, I, I absolutely love it here. Uh, it has come with many, many challenges. Um, I like to be involved with, with the community quite a bit. Um, and the challenges are very emotional for me. Uh, I, I try my, my, my goal, um, and my husband's goal, our goal as a family, when we decided we could have gone to Arizona, we could have gone to New, we could have gone somewhere else, but we figured the two of us represent one of the faces of Chaska. Can we become a bridge and bring the cultures together? And that is what we have done. And tonight, my daughter is in the pit for the high, just the high school musical. It's parent preview night, and when she heard that this was overlapping, she said, "Mom, you go. That's where you need to be tonight." So it is a mission that we would like to, to always have as a family. Um, we do represent that face of Jaska. And what else can we do to make sure that all these other faces come together? And how can we bridge that union? So everything that I do either at the high school or now that I work for the city of Jaska and I work for community ed, how can I make sure that our community feels a sense of belonging no matter what you look like, no matter what your accent is, no matter what your background is. So, Thank you. Um, yeah. So um, you kind of touched on those challenges, and I kind of want to dive deeper into those things. So um, when you first arrived at Chaska, how did you feel like your family was perceived with the, with the rest of the community? I really didn't see much difference, I guess. Um, the neighborhood we live in, I think we were one of the youngest family there because um, most of the residents there um, had older kids. So coming in and having younger kids who were running around and screaming, they, they were excited because there was, noise, there, was, there was noise in the neighborhood again. <laughs> That's what my neighbor my used to say. And um, especially during the winter, they would ask my kids to come and walk in their backyard too, so they'd see their footprints in their backyard <laughs> because it's all other footprints were in my backyard. So um, I think I was it wasn't a it, by by the time I got to Chaska, I had already got to use the American weather and everything, so I didn't see um, it was okay for me. And then the people were always 
you are nice. I mean, especially when they found out that we had just moved in, they're like, you will love this place. You really love this place. And, and yeah, we've, been, we've loved it. It's, it's, it's close. It's close enough to go, it's, it's close to everything you want to go to. It's close to the airport, it's close to go to downtown. But it's so further, like far away enough to be away from everything. And I, I like that, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Nana. Um, I'm especially, yeah, um, I'm especially interested with Gabby, because Gabby, you came here in 2005. And you opened up with Cheska My Love right away. Um, so I was really impressed with your story. So can you tell us more about that? Bueno, cuando vine aquí, pues yo quería llegar a trabajar. Es como la idea que, la idea que tenemos de trabajar, ¿verdad? Y, pero no quería trabajar en nada de cocina porque no me gusta para nada. Entonces mi mamá me dijo que había llenado una aplicación para poner un negocio de comida. Y lo primero que le dije, ya no te voy a ayudar. Conmigo no cuentes, por favor. I asked her to stop. <laughs> she said, the first thing is when I came to the U.S., we come with a mentality of working. So I wanted to come and get a job. And my, my thoughts was never to work in anything that has to do with cooking. Then my mom said that she had put in an application with the city for a restaurant, and my first response is like, don't call me and I'm not helping you do this. <laughs> Entonces, I got a job, and I only had to work for two months, because my mom told me, you're going to have to come and help me, because the person who is helping me can't. And my first experience of work was, um, I was a young man who worked in the bank, and he asked me a coffee. So I did get a job, not with my mom, but I only worked for two weeks because my mom called me and said the person that was helping me at the restaurant is not able to help me anymore. I was at the bank and my first experience is somebody came and asked me for coffee. My first, my first day working at Cheska My Love is actually I was at, uh, the bank manager came and asked me for a coffee and I was so nervous I spilled it all over him. Not knowing he was the bank manager. Y después me di cuenta que mi reto principal en este país iba a ser hacer las cosas rápido, trabajar y bañarme rápido y hacer todo rápido, un estilo de vida muy diferente en mi. So I realized that the challenges I was getting to face is that I had to do everything fast. I had to take a fast shower, I had to get dressed fast, and I had to do my job fast. Because that's the American system, very different to what I, what I was accustomed in Mexico. Same one? Um, so I'm going to pass it to Nana because she has two minutes with us. Um, she needs to catch a flight. <laughs> She's like looking at her tech too. Um, so, Nana, before you leave, um, can you tell us um, what traditions in Chaska have you most um, loved participating in and look forward to participating in the year? Well, um, I do have kids, so most, <laughs> of my, most of my fun stuff I do with the kids. So, a lot of the um, things that um, the community organizes for the kids Um, not to one one of the major ones that come to mind is the um, the fishing with friends. I think that's what they are called. All my kids always have a blast when we go to that, and it's been it's been it, it's been rewarded. And then a few of the um, events that is organized at the fire firelands. Yeah, we also we also go there. And We've also been to the farmers market several times, and mm -hmm. especially the tokens that they give to the kids. My kids never forget that it's a Wednesday. We need to go to the farmers market. So <laughs> that has been, yeah, you know, one of the. If you mention a few, yeah. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you want to leave 
us with before you head out? I think it's 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 amazing how in my language you say unless you move out from your house, you never know whether your garden is the best or the worst. It's when you travel out then you can you can see how personally you are doing and then you you appreciate where you are, where you come from and then try and do your best. Just like how my sister here was saying, you have learned to do things fast because from where I came from it's a relaxed country, <laughs> take your time, breathe, enjoy the weather. But over here you have to learn to do things on time and it's been it has been amazing and I've seen how much um, how much I have improved personally and and but at the same time I've I've learned to also share my side of the story, how family is very, very um, important to us. We are very family oriented, so I can literally just leave my kids with my sister and I don't have to explain anything and she just finds to go along with it. And that hasn't I have seen that being different, very, very different here and I have I've learned to also accept how it is against teach some of my friends that uh, if I call you my friend, if I call you my family, my sister, you have to do this. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Um, I guess I don't know to answer the question. Yes, you did. <laughs> Thank you, Nana. Thank you, you are, for being with yeah, us. It's, it's been a pleasure being here. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to catch a flight, by the way. If, if you see me around, you can stop, and I can, I can tell you more stuff from Ghana. I don't mind sharing about that. It's, it's really a beautiful place. I call it all summer, year-round country. It's just a wet season and a dry season. So you want a place to go and relax at the beach, because we are still right by the beach. You should go to Ghana, and I'll go with you and take you around. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to go back home, I would love to do that. So. Yeah. Right. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, so now I'm going to kind of include myself in the panelist, <laughs> um, if that's all okay with everyone. Um, so I really admire um, Gabby and Mania because I had the pleasure of working with them and being in community with them, um, and they are really pillars in the Latino community here at Chaska. Um, when, the, when I was working at the district, um, I had the opportunity to work directly at Chaska High School, and Maria was doing like going above and beyond her teacher role. Um, she is going like talking, connecting with new recent arrival immigrants from their home countries. Um, she helps them apply for housing. Um, she's there to you know give them rights, whatever they need, whatever advocacy their children need. Like she is there for them. Um, and Gabby, um, specifically when the pandemic hit, um, with the restaurant and kids not not really knowing if, you know, our community needed, you know, food or, you know, if there was any other needs, she called me because she knew I was working with the district and she said, what do kids need? Do they need food? I can make like an order and I can have them delivered at the schools or, you know, at their homes, like, please keep me um, looped in. So um, I want to talk about and dive deeper into, you know, what challenges do you see in the community, whether, you know, was it during the pandemic or now? Um, here in Chaska. That is, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think as a district, and I think as a, a, and I also think the city of Chaska, we've grown a lot um, in, ma in many positive ways. We still need to do a lot of growing. Um, when I moved here, my first week of a school, walking into my building uh, from the parking lot inside just the high school, I was walking with a group of teachers, and a custodian that was there said, oh, hi, why are you here? Aren't Mexicans lazy? And none of the teachers that walked in with me said a word. And that was okay. Nobody said a word, right? Um, my first uh, teacher parent conferences uh, was very interesting with parents saying, why are you here? You need to go back where you belong. Mm -hmm. And students 
misbehaving and say, well, my dad is going to talk to the principal because you shouldn't be here. We want an American teacher. Mexicans should not be teaching Spanish. Mexicans should be back in Mexico. I'm not from Mexico. Um, but even if I would be from Mexico, right? So these were my experiences um, at the beginning, you know, going to Target. And I was patted down several times. I was asked to take my jacket off during the winter and make sure that I was not stealing anything. My experience at the public library here in Chaska was we don't issue cards to illegal people. Uh, my experience when I was trying to get my squad, my driver's license, it was the same thing. You can take the test if you want to, but illegal people don't get their licenses. So um, from there to where we are today, 17 years later, I think we've grown a lot. I have the most powerful tool which is the language. So I can advocate for myself, and I know how to talk to, if, if it's not working with the person here, I know how to talk to the person here, and I have done that, and I've had to do that, I've learned to do that, in order to advocate, but when I advocate, it's not just for myself, I want to believe that I carry the voice of many people. And these things should not happen. I should not have to explain myself. And so the microaggressions that I think minority um, communities suffer are constant, and they're all day long. I work for the city of Jaska, and I do still have some people who have known me for years, and if I ask a question that is a little, if it's, if it's not a question that we want to answer, I, the answer that I get is, well, let me explain explain it to you. <laughs> I do speak the language. I may not speak the culture quite fluently yet, but I do speak the language. So that's the, uh, things like um, people making fun of my accent or people making comments about the Latino culture or any other culture for that matter. So these are, these are small things that people don't realize and that's why they are called microaggressions, but they happen all day long. And I, and I get to see it with my students quite often. And when they come to me, it's just so frustrating for them because they don't have they don't have the power that I have as an adult. They don't have the power that I have as a teacher to to help people understand that whatever they said or whether whatever they are doing is extremely hurtful. Um, and I think something else that people don't realize when we come here, we the majority of us have to give up part of our identity. And, and, and it's a very difficult process. I had to, to give up my citizenship in order to be able to vote. Now I can vote, but I couldn't vote until very recently. These elections was the first time that I ever voted. I couldn't even vote for a school board, right? So uh, I had to change my last name. I had to give up my mother's name because, you know, they, it's a certain way your social security number can only have a number of, of names, so I had to give up my mom's name in order for me to say I'm American, right? So the list goes on. Um, so I think these are the biggest challenges, uh, feeling like Nayeli has said at the beginning, um, I'm very Americanized. When I, go, when I go home, when I go to Ecuador, that is still my home, um, I, need to, I need to be very Ecuadorian otherwise. I, I, I am not going to be accepted there anymore. Um, and so it's navigating, knowing how to navigate this world, and for, for my students, for a lot of them, uh, the juggling game is even, is even bigger, and it's even more difficult, because they need to fit in with the, with the high school culture if they want to be successful. But that, not, that is not necessarily their own culture. So then they go home, and they need to wear that different hat so that they can belong in their family an extended family. So it gets very complicated. Um, it, it, and it's a, it's a very delicate, it's a very uh, delicate game that I think we e immigrants work with. Um, so every time I find people who are willing to listen and willing to learn, it's just for me, it's really a gift because people don't have to, right? They should, but they don't have to. Um, so be, being open to us and being open to learn is, is the greatest thing that you can do. And, and for me, um, it was an event just like this. It was here at the community center 17 years ago. Uh, it was in the first of all that I was living here in Chaska. It was exactly the same thing, a panel with 
people of color and during the questions and answer part of the presentation I stood up and my question was how does an immigrant adapt to this monstrosity? It was just so overwhelming for me. A new job, no friends, no family, uh, a one-year-old kid. I mean, it was just so overwhelming. And it was former uh, Chief Knight, uh, uh, police uh, chief. He gave me a purpose. He was the one who gave me a purpose and he said, oh, you want to work for our community? Oh, I have a lot of jobs for you. <laughs> um, and, you know, until he retired, he and I worked alongside and we did so many things, but it was, it was him trusting that I could make a difference. And so for all of you who are here, you have that power of giving us that purpose. And he really, truly changed my life. And I don't know how much he really did, right? It was, it was almost like, hey, I can help you. What do you need? And I needed a lot of things that he was able to support and provide. Not things, not material things. It was just more to share this passion. It was just sharing the ideas and dreams maybe even. Um, so that is something that you can do when you come across one of us. And alongside you, we can make it happen. Wow, thank you. Um, welcome, Suad. Um, we are, yes, um, Chaska High School student, um, senior? Yeah. <laughs> Spanish <laughs> 4. Spanish 4. <laughs> um, so we are just talking about some of the challenges um, that we see in our communities, but I do want to give you an opportunity to talk about like your family's immigrant um, story. Um, you can choose to talk about like your name, anything you would like to tell us about um, your experience. Um, oh, sorry, I was trying to speak. <laughs> Hi, so I'm just going to introduce myself first. Um, I'm Suad Muhammad. I'm a senior at Chaska High School. Um, I'm not an immigrant myself, but both of my parents are immigrants uh, from Somalia. So um, my family immigrated here, I want to say, in the late 90s um, with two children. So my two older siblings were also immigrants. Um, Yes, um, who did they leave behind? Who did they come? Why Chaska? So um, my mom was actually the first in her family to immigrate to America. Um, so she was kind of alone. She went um, by herself before my dad did. So um, she first moved to Texas uh, where she had my sister. And then they eventually moved to Minnesota. So um, Minnesota has a large small community, which is why my mom moved here because she was kind of alone. Um, with no other family because she left everyone behind. Um, at the time, there was a war going on, which is why my mom moved here, um, for safety, for her children, and for um, a better future for us. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Gabby, querías responder a la pregunta de las dificultades que vence la comunidad? Ok, uno de los retos cuando abrimos nuestro negocio en 2005 eh, fue el principal, el idioma. Y el segundo, que pues no sabíamos realmente cómo abrir un negocio. Solo nos rentaron el local y pensamos ya, mañana abrimos. Y no, había que sacar licencias, permisos. Y una compañera de trabajo de mi mamá la ayudó a una... A una y pues gracias a Dios no tuvimos ese problema de racismo ni nada porque el que nos renta local pues siempre nos ha ayudado y nos ha en lo que ha podido o sea. first of all after hearing Maria speak it's like I want to be part of this panel <laughs> thank you for everything you do the second side of that um, Gabby said that the first obstacle she was to mention a challenge was the language not speaking the language. So once they were approved, the application was approved to open a restaurant, she's like, cool, oh, we'll start tomorrow, we got this. Not knowing that you need a license, you need insurance, you need permits, and you need all these rules and regulations to follow in language was a barrier. But thank God there was a coworker, an American coworker, that um, her mom knew that helped them navigate this. And they haven't, 
She doesn't feel that they have gone through a lot of racism as the person that owns the building has been very um, helpful and kind and understanding and has always supported them. Yeah, y una señorita que trabajaba en la ciudad, en la City Hall, um, se llama Jackie, ella nos, también nos ayudó a inscribirnos a todos los eventos. Era nuestro primer año y ya estábamos en la Cámara de Comercio y todo. Y ni hablaban nada, yo nada de inglés y ella nada de español, pero ella hacía todo, llevaba aplicaciones y todo, para que participáramos en todos los eventos. There was a young lady by the name of Jackie that worked at City Hall. She didn't speak Spanish, we didn't speak English, but she signed us up for all the events. Somehow we were even part of the chamber through all it all. So in the first year, without speaking anything, we were in all the events and we were signed up to be everywhere. Y mi primera experiencia con la comunidad de Chasca fue en el Taste of Chasca. Y hasta me entrevistaron en un periódico. No sabía ni qué decir. Porque pues venía de, este, de México, Acá apenas tenía como dos meses de haber llegado, pero ya estaba ahí contestando preguntas y todo, y la gente de aquí bien amigable y todo, todos nos, nos respaldaron. Uh, my first experience with the Chasca community was at the Taste of Chasca, and a newspaper showed up to interview us, which I had no idea what I was saying and what to say, but there I was answering all those questions. People in Chasca were super friendly, we felt welcome, and we always felt that it, we, they, they wanted us here. Y acerca del tiempo de la pandemia, ahorita para mi comunidad la latina, fue muy difícil porque no está en nuestra, en nuestra cultura el pedir y lo más sad for me was I called one friend and I said how are you? That is I'm really bad. Me and my husband don't have the work, we don't have any to eat and I told him, I told him, I know one person can give you some food and can give you some money to pay your rent. And she didn't believe me. She said, I don't have social security, I don't have nothing. You don't need it. There's a lot of organization to help us in this pandemic time. Uh, how did kids do? Uh, after the pandemic, we were highly impacted. The rest she said in English, and then she said, I have hundreds of stories like that one with our community of how the pandemic has impacted us. Yeah, y lo más triste es ahora que somos más latinos aquí, es la gran necesidad que tenemos de tener una licencia para poder manejar y para poder movernos a nuestros trabajos. I would say the saddest story for us Latinos is not being able to have a driver's license, not being able to drive to our jobs and, and to get to what we need. Gracias, thank you. Um, so yeah, I can go back to Suad. Um, so as I'm listening to you all talk, I keep hearing about these connectors, right? I heard Jackie, um, I heard, um, the chief, yeah, the chief. Um, so, so Ad, who were some of those connectors, or who are you know still present, or were helping your family, you know, kind of settle? Or you could even talk about current mentors. Yeah. Okay, so I'm on my um, school speech team, um, and my coach, um, her name is Sarah. She's amazing, and she's been a huge impact on my life. Um, so. Through speech, I've been able to tell the story of my family and through many experiences that I've had um, as a first generation black woman. Um, and through speech, um, she gave me that voice and that ability to tell my story to many people. Um, and she's been there for me and my family throughout the entire speech career. So she's just been a great mentor um, and just having that ability to tell other people what I've experienced, um, and giving me that platform to do so is like amazing. And um, I just like really, really appreciate it. So just joining the speech team was 
a way for me to, I guess, express those grievances that I've experienced as a first generation immigrant and just telling my story. So that's part of it. Yeah, and I think it's so powerful, especially because I remember um, when I first arrived in Chaska, I just I, when I um, was in seventh grade, I came into contact with a woman in her 30s, and she spoke fluent English. I was like, you speak English? Um, and she's like, yeah, I've been here for a while. You've been here for a while? I thought we were new. Um, so what we are, whether we're recent immigrants, I feel like it's so important to tell those stories because then we're able to say, like, okay, I'm not necessarily the first one. I don't, you know, there have been people, women, men, who have been those trailblazers and continue to make those differences in our lives. So, yes, absolutely. Um, so, um, the next question I want to transition to, whoever wants to answer, um, what have been your greatest sources of joy in our community? I can start us off if you'd like. Um, I um, grew up in Riverview Terrace, um, which is our one of our trailer parks. Um, and they are awesome because they make sure to do events um, around holidays. So for Halloween, um, they have us dress up and they always had like in the shelter um, community events. And then um, the city is, was actually like pretty instrumental and um, building like gardens and connecting us and taking us out to do all types of service projects around recycling. Um, so that's, um, those ha have been my connections and my greatest senses of joy while growing up. Um, ya sea donando algo de comida o, o algo de especie y pues otras cosas que me hacen pues feliz en este momento es el que toman en cuenta más nuestra palabra y que pues se toman el tiempo de escuchar pues nuestras necesidades One of the things that have brought me great joy is to be able to give back to my community whether it's through, through a meal or in some kind of service that I can provide and also that now you're taking into account our word, that what we have to say matters and that there's this type of opportunities. Y también algunas cosas que me, han, que me inspiran a echarle más ganas de seguir trabajando, pues ver historias de pues, gente como yo que vinieron, pues, o que llegaron desde mi país y que se han superado y que tienen sus carreras y todo, y pues me inspiran a también ya por una terminar en mi escuela. The other thing that has brought me joy is having the role models, people from our community that are making it out there, that, that have achieved goals, and that inspires me to hurry up and get my career done. Well, you know, in the, in the same way that I talked about some of the challenges, uh, the reason why my husband and I are here is because I truly believe this is the land of dreams. Um, and the support, the resources um, are right there for those of us who dream big. And for me, it's definitely, you know, my students like SWAT and all my other students uh, throughout the years. Uh, just last week, I was dropping off my daughter at school, and here comes one of my students. Uh, he's 28. I had one, he was 14 and 15, and called out his name, and he's carrying this big box. and. So I'm like, what are you doing here? And he goes, oh, I'm, I'm the tennis coach for the JV team. And when he was in my class, um, uh, the day that he graduated, Kevin is his name, the day that Kevin graduated, he came to say goodbye and he said, my dream is to one day be a coach, a tennis coach at Chaska High School so that I can mentor young, young men of color. And so fast forward all those years, and he's a man now, and he's sharing with me, mm -hmm. I am the tennis coach at Chaska High School. Um, so it's just, you know, stories like that that are so inspiring. The other day I went to the dentist, and I walk in, and it is, 
I cannot explain with words how amazing it feels when somebody calls me Maria. That's my name. And because, you know, people call me Maria, which is, you know, the, the American accent, which is absolutely fine. And I'm walking into my dentist office and I hear Maria. And I'm like, oh, hablas espanol. And she's like, so excited. And she goes, you don't know me anymore. And I'm like, I don't know you anymore. And she goes, I'm Jasmine. And I was in your class many, many years ago. And so here you have this wonderful young woman who went through Chaska High School, who couldn't go to college right after high school, but who was able to keep two jobs to be able to save money, went to Normandale, transferred to Hennepin Technical College, and now she, she is a, 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 a dental hygienist. I mean, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. I have my daughter who's 15, and I know that she's gonna be whomever she wants to be. She is going to, change this world, just like SWAT and just like all these other females of color that I work with. Whereas in my country, that's why I left. I couldn't be there because I was a little too liberal to, to be part of the culture, to be honest with you. And so for my daughter, it's kind of the same, you know? It's for these girls, for our girls, for our women of color. This is the perfect country, despite many, many difficulties that we face. This is the perfect place. So I appreciate that very much as well. Thank you, Maria. Um, so, our last question before I open it up to the audience is, um, what do you wish more people knew about immigrants or others that are new to the community? We need a purpose. people to know that we're a, we're a source of employment, but we're also the, the drive and strength of employment. Um, just to add on to what she said, I definitely agree. I think that there's a like misconception of immigrants um, in the workforce. So I definitely think like any immigrant that I know are probably the hardest working people um, that I know for sure. So I think that more people, I wish more people would appreciate them, um, just from the hard work that they do. Um, like, currently, like, my grandpa just recently immigrated here about like a month ago, and he's, like, already out looking for jobs, and, like, you know, like, just trying to enter the workforce and just be, I guess, present in our community, and I guess that kind of go, that gets overlooked um, by many people, and they kind of just have this misconception of, like, immigrants come here, take our jobs, and this, this, and that, but, like, in reality, that, they are probably the most hardworking people in our communities, and like you said, they're the backbone of a lot of our workforces. So. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to open it up for questions. You have to have some questions. <laughs> yep. Hi, uh, Maria. Um, you mentioned what happened years ago when you first started. You know, our, I'm hoping that our country is improving with the racism that is in our country, and, and, and it's really, it's really too bad. It's, it's uh, I, I guess my question to you is, have you seen a big difference uh, since, we'll say, in the last few years, the George Floyd incident and everything else? Have you, have you seen people? Uh, uh, try to make a difference? You know, that is a great question, and it's a question that um, I have a lot of passion about. And I think we we need to try to look at it from both perspectives. And you know, I, I am married to a white family, and that has many, many advantages. So I think um, since I moved here to now, the district and the city of Chaska both have grown in I mean, it's just amazing how much we have grown for the better. We still need to keep growing. Um, so I have seen changes, uh, whereas before I would have been, if I, let's say, had to return something, 
um, that was sealed, you know, let's say a box that was not, never opened. If I went to the store, they would check the box, they will open it up and they will go, you know, you used it, we can't return, you can't return it, for example. So if my husband came five minutes later, he could return it, things like that. I don't see that as much anymore. Um, what I do see, and you brought the, you know, the George Floyd incident, what I have seen in the past few years is that the, the divide is a lot bigger in the sense of there are more people trying to be more inclusive and there are more people that are trying to be more exclusive. And I think one of the greatest problems that we have right now is that the people that want to be, some of the people that want to be inclusive don't know how. And sometimes I feel that if a white person asks a question, we criticize that person because the question was not worded correctly, for example, and I don't feel that's fair. Or if somebody asks a question with the wrong wording because they don't have the right wording, they go, oh, it's your white privilege talking. And so that person is, you know, feels apprehensive. I'm never going to ask again, and I'm going to feel bad, and I'm going to feel guilty. So it's, it's there, there's a very fine line between let me teach you how to ask the same question so some people don't get offended, but please keep asking that same question. Don't stop, and if you offend somebody, just say, you know, I didn't mean to offend you, this is what I'm trying to ask, could you please teach me a better way of asking this question? So that for all of you, and for example, for me, I still call Ecuador home, I work with somebody who gets really upset when somebody says, are you going home anytime soon for, to visit your family or over the summer? Because home for her is the United States, so she feels offended. So the same question, ordered exactly the same, when you talk it to different immigrants, it may carry a different, a different intention, if you will. And so I am a very um, apprehensive about judging white people who are trying to learn what to do and how to handle what is happening. As a country, I don't know where we are at, uh, but I can tell you, and not even, not even maybe Minnesota, but I can tell you that um, the city of Chaska has grown a lot. I think they're trying, I think we still are growing. Um, our district has grown a ton. Um, it is really hard, I think, for us to retain people of color. There are only two teachers of color in my building, just two. Um, but we are trying, it's not that we don't want to, just, it's hard. Yeah, but please keep asking questions. Don't worry about the wording. Um, I just, I'm thankful that you are asking the right questions. Yes, um, do we have additional questions? Yes. So first of all, Naomi, thank you for doing the web announcement. It is the first time when I attended the Shasta event, an event organizing Shasta, that have that in the part of the world. Thank you very much. Yes. How do you react to the You're My question to you is, what is next? So 17 years ago, right, you, Maria, you attended that event, right? And then um, basically, here we are 17 years later. Now, the Human Rights Commission is very passionate about putting together events to honor various identities and, and not only places in some way or another, but the, what could we do and support from the city of Chaska. What could we do next? What would be the next level, the next step after this event, after this month? For a long time, for the 17 years, I've been asking myself and I've been asking people, why isn't the city and the district working closer together? So why aren't we working? We are, we are serving the same community, and I keep asking, and, and I hear, no, we are, we, we are. We need to have a very strong, intimate partnership because we are serving the same population. Mm -hmm. So I think the weaknesses of the city are the strengths of the district and the other way around. So only really and truly working together Side by side, we're going to achieve what we need to achieve. Because in the, in the district, let's say, we have the expertise with our younger generation and we know exactly what it takes to see them bloom. 
the city has a little bit of money. <laughs> and the city has different organizations that are going to be willing to support those young people growing up and becoming the model citizens that we want them to be. But when we don't work together, or when we talk to each other, but we don't work together, I think that's the issue. So just something that comes, you know, just from the top of my mind, um, I'm the advisor of SOAR, which is a group of, there are a couple boys that come to the meetings, but it's mainly a group of, uh, a group of uh, girls um, of color, and they're in ninth and 10th grade. And they were today, I couldn't go with them, but they were in uh, um, Eden Prairie High School wants to mimic SOAR at their school. They want to mimic this club. And the Y North uh, gave them some training today. So they were in Minneapolis today. And so these girls, for example, they want to do so much. They, they, they are ready. They are like, give me more. How can we educate people? They have the passion, they have the drive. And really for me is, I have a dream, they are making it come true. It is that generation. And so I think really partnering up with our high school students is the best thing. But I'd like to hear what SWAT thinks because you know she went through the system. Is it, I'm sorry, that's not my job. Is it okay to put her in Yeah, system? of course. <laughs> I was gonna ask her too. So could you repeat the question? Yes, what do you see as the next step after this? Like what would be the next So growing up in like majority white schools my entire life, this conversation basically didn't happen until what, like I'd say my high school career when I joined the Equity Hub, which Nayeli uh, organized. Um, so I think implementing, like Profe was saying, um, more clubs and just introducing those conversations not only in extracurriculars but also in our classrooms. And I think that in theory this sounds easy, but um, it's really not, but actually just, I guess our history classes more specifically, kind of just implementing those conversations more and educating our students more because I think that, like she was saying, that the next generation is probably the most important um, in these conversations and to propel them forward, I think that starting there would probably be the best, uh, I guess, idea. Um, so in the sense of, bringing together more students and starting the conversation there um, just so they can have a voice because throughout my entire, like the majority of my school career, I never really had that opportunity to speak up against any sort of, I guess, racism or Islamophobia or anything of that sort because I was never given that opportunity. We never had those clubs in school and um, speaking at a stance of someone who was one of the only black people in my classrooms or in my school in general. Um, it's kind of nerve wracking, I guess, to speak against those things when you don't really have anyone sitting up with you. So I think that if we create more um, safe spaces for those students where they feel comfortable leading those conversations and I guess erasing that ignorance with their own peers, that that could lead to a greater step in which those conversations will be more comfortable for other people and where it will lead to greater change um, in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, um, I'll just add to that. And Gabby, if you wanna answer, that's great too. Um, for me, the longest time is that when I was in college um, and I was reflecting on like the history and the context of um, where I grew up in Traska, um, I felt so robbed of my history. I was like, I don't know anything about the Latino community in Traska. I don't know who's been there before me. So um, once I started learning my own history within my own context, I was like, me and my white peers are operating in two different historical contexts, right? So I hear Maria's story. Um, and so then I carry that with me um, as I'm engaging out in the world and, you know, I have similar friends and relatives who go through the same thing. Um, but then, you know, with my white friends, it was very much like, no, we don't have a problem. We don't have a racial problem and I haven't seen that. 
Um, so if we're not operating in the same historical context and we're not listening to each other's stories, um, then how do we move forward? Um, how do we know where the needs are? How do we know where we need to make amends? Um, so for example, yes, okay, great. Um, I would love to see um, a community start documenting those stories. Um, where they're not just like gatherings that spring up here and there, but like they're really documented. Um, you know, the painful things in our history and the joyful things that um, come about too. Can I add? Yes. Yeah. I just want to piggyback on that. I'm going to insert myself in the panel, so sorry. <laughs> but I, I see, per your question, the city of Chester, Carver County is moving forward. I also lived in Riverview Terrace in, in the 90s. And what I see now to what we saw then, it's a huge change, especially after George Floyd. Um, Carver County Public Health has started a community, an equity community engagement program that's about to launch here in Carver County, which is great, which we're assigned to actually work with the school district and empower our communities to, to belong, that sense of belonging, because we talked about this, right? We all do good when we all do good. So I'm excited of what Chesca is doing in Carver County moving forward, but if you ask me what you did, but what's next, look around. We need to fill the seats. present 
Uh, I know it's right at Iftar. So you're like, I'm so hungry. Um, so thank you everyone for showing up. That means a lot to us here.